Uh, hello everybody, my name is Mihai Karabash and today I will present you the 7 restore future for Beehive. Basically saving a virtual machine state on the disk and then restoring at a point in time. Uh, this work was done by, with my master students, Mihai Tsigonosh and Flavius Anton. First of all, something about us. We are all from the University Polytechnic of Bucharest. Uh, I'm, I was a PhD student, so two weeks ago my diploma arrived and right now I have my PhD. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Currently I'm a teaching assistant and I'll be an associate professor starting from October in the operating system field, system architecture and also system administration and networks. I've been implementing and coordinating FreeBSD projects for four years now. So I've started with Dragonfly BSD four years ago and then moved to Beehive FreeBSD. And uh, since then I've been working on Beehive. Uh, Mihai Tsigonosh and Falvis Anton are two of my master students. They are now finishing the master. And they worked on Beehive as their diploma project, uh, as their master thesis project, sorry. Uh, worked about eight months on this, starting from last, last summer, the, the whole summer, and uh, autumn and winter. They are also teaching assistants at operating system. They help me with the homework and teaching classes. Uh, in the University of Technology of Bucharest, we promote, I promote Beehive projects through the diploma and master students. I have a lot of um, students that want to do kernel programming, and this is very suitable for them. A lot of, the, lot of uh, work has been done until now in the university. A lot of drivers, starting with the instruction caching future in the Google Summer of Code project, uh, the emulation of different drivers, any 2080A, this controller. Uh, these two aren't yet merged into the current. Peter is working on this. Uh, he wants to create an abstraction for the device and then integrate this into them. If you're asking why these two old drivers, is because Beehive wants to support very old guests, okay? Like Windows, uh, very old Windowses or very old FreeBSDs that does, doesn't have support for newer network cards or disk controllers. Another interesting project was the emulation of HD audio device driver, which is also in Peter's hands right now. So it's functioning, but it has to be ported, uh, it has to be merged into master. And the uh, last two projects I work, worked intensively on are the porting behind one arm, uh, basically running uh, FreeBSD guests on top of Beehive. Uh, this, I presented this project in, at HIBSDCon. Uh, right now, from HIBSDCon until now, we managed to fully run a guest and uh, get its console on a Cubiboard DOI. So we have a host, a FreeBSD host, and on top of it, we have a FreeBSD guest that is able to run and get the console. Uh, this is under reviewing to merge all the patches in, in upstream. And the last project I will talk about today is Beehive Save Restore Future mechanism. Uh, before starting, special thanks to Peter Grehan. He helped us in all the design decision. We had a lot of blockers at the beginning, a lot of throw out code, uh, and he helped us integrate better uh, the 7 Restore feature in Beehive and in FreeBSD. And also thanks to Matthew Grooms, his sponsorship, the students um, during their master's projects, and you give them scholarships. Okay, uh, let's start with, with having a brief description of Beehive and FreeBSD and then present the technical implementation of the Save Restore feature. Uh, as you all know, the Beehive is the FreeBSD hypervisor. It depends on the hardware extension Intel VTX and, and MDV. It's very important because when doing save, save restore uh, steps, you have to save all the internal structures. So save the Intel uh, VMX internal fields and also AMDV. For now, we, also, we only save the Intel VTX. Uh, we left a path for AMD, but it's not implemented. Also, uses of the nested page tables. It, it's also, it's very important when saving the guest memory. So th these were two facts that were uh, took into, into consideration when, when implementing this. 
and can run various guests. Until now, we only tested with FreeBSD, the save restore feature I'm talking about. Okay, everyone is talking about uh, Beehive live migration, but as a prerequisite, we have to support checkpoint. Well, what is live migration? Basically, checkpoint the VM on the source host, migrate, migrate the memory on the destination, and start the, um, the virtual machine on the destination host. So this is a prerequisite for the <coughs> uh, live migration. So for adding the checkpoint to Beehive, we have to save the VM, the virtual machine state to a persistent storage, basically the memory and, the, and its state, internal state, hypervisor state. And when restoring, basically we create a new virtual machine and initialize the, all the structures and the memory with the one that we saved on the disk. These are the big steps. Let's see what are the Beehive components. So in the FreeBSD kernel, we have the vmm.ko uh, kernel module, which exposes an interface for each virtual machine, dev, vmm, and the name of the virtual machine. Using this device, uh, Beehive load basically loads the kernel image into the memory. And with Beehive control, you can set or get, or, or get various fields of the state of the virtual machine. Further, in order to run the virtual machine, you have the Beehive run executable, which does IOCTLs to the dev VMM, basically telling the, uh, the, uh, the FreeBSD kernel to run the, the virtual machine. Whenever there are exceptions that couldn't be treated by the FreeBSD kernel, they are sent up to Beehive run to treat them, okay? Like device simulation. Basically, the whole device simulation is done in Beehive Run, other from small parts, which are very critical, and they are done in the kernel. OK, let's see what steps we have taken to create a checkpoint. So we have these states uh, we, uh, we presented earlier. Further, we create a new device called dev vmm uh, vm underscore memory. vm is the name of the virtual machine underscore memory. Then we added a new, f a new flag to Beehive control, name checkpoint, and the name of the virtual machine. The be Beehive control is talking with the Beehive run via the, a Unix socket. Uh, here, we had a problem uh, in the last months when Peter integrated the Capiscum framework, which is blocking the opening of new sockets and so on. So right now, the Capiscum is turned off for in our branch. OK. Uh, Peter said that he would solve that when integrating this feature into, into the master. Then we send an IOCTL to freeze all the virtual machine, basically freeze the, uh, the CPUs. Then we are memory mapping this device. And this is a key feature, the copy and write part. We created a new device in order to implement a new function, uh, a new a uh, memory mapping function that would map the same physical memory as copy and write. So at this step, we have two different mappings of the same physical memory, okay? And the second one is the copy and write mapping. What, what this means, it means that if from now on we start the guest, and the guest would write something in memory, yes, it would be created a new physical chunk and written in there, and this view of the memory would be made constant. Basically, at this point, we can let the guest run and save its memory, okay? So the checkpoint, if we have uh, 60 giga gigabytes uh, of RAM in a guest, okay, uh, make the calculation how much does to save 60 gigabytes um, of RAM into the disk, okay? probably a lot of seconds, 10, 20. You cannot um, <coughs> stop a guest for, for such a long period of time because it, it would lost all the network connection and so on. And with this mechanism, basically we create a view of its memory at a point in time and let the guest run. And we start saving memory on disk. Okay, so we have said, basically we have access to the memory of the guest. Further, we need to save the internal state of the hypervisor, of the beehive. 
uh, there are three principal structures in Beehive, struct BMX, which is Intel specific. Okay. Uh, it has a lot of Intel registers and capabilities. Struct VM is Beehive specific and has information about the virtual machine. And the Struct um, VR APIC is the programming trap controller, the virtual programming trap controller, and we have to save different states from there. And they are basically uh, get from the kernel using an IOCTL, um, IOCTL call. At this point, we have in Beehive run the struct buffer, which has all the internal state of the hypervisor, the, a view of the guest memory, okay, and the virtual machine. These are still in Beehive run memory. They aren't saved on disk. At this point, we start saving them on disk. Basically, uh, VM memory, it's only copying from memory to a file. It's a very simple operation. Again, it's the view that is copy on right of the guest. At that point, we make the checkpoint, not the current one, which may differ. We also save the kernel binary file. We need this to restore the guest later because Beehive load needs the kernel, uh, the kernel um, binary. And the hardest part was to save all the structures into the, on, on, into the disk in a parsable format. And we use the libxo uh, library, and we save them in a JSON metadata file. Basically, here we have the structures, serialize the, all the structures. And all the state of the virtual machine is on disk. Okay, Memory and internal structure, on, no devices at this point. Okay, uh, now let's see how can we restore a virtual machine having this information in place. We would boot a new virtual machine empty with Beehive load. Then uh, Beehive run, the process that runs the virtual machine, reads all the metadata from the disk, only reads them in memory. Then we let Beehive run do all the virtual machine initialization. Okay, there are a lot of steps that, that need to be done, and we don't play with them. Just let them do the initialization, and after that, we just replace some of the saved information from some of the structure we saved, not all. Okay, let's see in a graphical way this. Uh, from user space, from Beehive run, we have the VM restore function, which does an IOCTL, which does an IOCTL to the dev VMM, VMM um, device, and it's called the VMM restore function from kernel which I'll describe later. The VM restore then does the memory restore. You see that uh, we do the mem memory restore from user space because only the user space have access to the files that are on disk. The kernel doesn't have. Okay, then we call the PCI restore. The PCI restore refers to all the VO, APIC, and some other internal structure. And after all these functions were executed, we basically start the vCPU threads and the virtual machine starts running. Uh, what does the VMM restore do in kernel? Uh, it's calling the VMX restore. The VMX restore is restoring Intel specific registers, okay? So if for AMD, would we'll have AMD V uh, restore. We have to implement that. AO APIC restore, VL APIC, and uh, VHPAT. All these are for the controller for, and for the IO, basic IO device and the timer. You can see that for each structure, we have multiple calls. These calls are for each, uh, for each vCPU. All the restore structures needs to be done, needs to be executed for each vCPU. For example, here we had a, a virtual machine with four vCPUs. You, you see a, VM, a VM CS restore four times. Lapic restore four times again. Um, okay. Restoring devices. Until now, I, didn't ha I haven't talked about devices. We want to do mainly Vertio. Uh, this is the because Vertio is the de facto standard of device um, 
virtualization, power virtualization, power virtualization actually, and only with Virt.io you could support um, virtual machine migration. Okay? If you have an em emulated device even on CAM or KVM, you cannot mi uh, migrate the virtual machine. Also on Hyper-V, if you have the emulated devices, not their synthetic one, you can't live migrate. You have to, do, to have power virtualized Virt.io devices in order to be able to migrate. And this is why we concentrate only on Virt.io. Okay? We have a working Virt.io network interface with save state and restore state. I'll show you later. And we have a work, work in progress for the Virt.io disk. Basically, we save its all um, internal structure, but it's a problem in saving the, the actual data because the disk is very large, 100 gigabytes to 101 tera. Okay, and when doing a save, basically we save the state and then copy the file, duplicate the file. And it's very time consuming duplicating uh, such a big file. An alternative I'll, uh, would be to use the Z, uh, ZFS backend. Okay, having a ZFS in the virtual machine, issue a ZFS checkpoint and have the checkpoint in place um, at runtime very fast. So uh, I won't describe the saving and restoring the virtual devices. It's another subject, and I, I won't constant, concentrate on this right now in a future presentation. What problems did you have? We have problems is restoring the VMCS. So VMCS, uh, VMC, yes, VMCS, it's a structure containing uh, host and guest state for Intel. Okay? The problem is that the same structure has uh, registers mixed up between host and guest. At the, at, at the beginning, we are just dumping the old VMCS and then restoring it, at the, and the host crashed, crashed out. This is because we need to, to save and restore only the guest-specific registers, not the host ones. Uh, and we have to get to each field and read, uh, read them and write them, like this. So, uh, set uh, VMPT, uh, sorry, VMPT RLD, it's an instruction that sets the current VMCS, then you can read the current VMCS with VM read. So basically, we set the old VMCS, we are reading the uh, instruction pointer, then setting the new VMCS, the new virtual machine VMCS, and then writing the instruction pointer. And this we have, done, we have to, to do for all the registers of the virtual machine. A lot of, another problem was saving the structures. Okay, we have two structures, two, uh, struct VMX and struct VM, and both of them are having pointers one to each other. Okay, after restoring them, you would see that these pointers aren't valid anymore, and you cannot make them valid because these structures are created again on other addresses. And we had to manually parse all the pointers of the structures and correct them. This was another source of errors that took, a, took us a month to fix because a lot, of them, a lot of these would crash the host and you don't have any means to debug this. Okay, what's the current status? We basically managed to restore virtual machines with, with up to seven vCPUs. Unfortunately, our testing host that didn't have more than eight uh, physical CPUs and up to um, seven gigabytes of RAM. Also, our host doesn't have more than eight gigabytes of RAM. And we use the read-only virtual disk or a RAM disk in order to be able to save and restore it because we don't have the save restore feature for the disk and only one Virt.io network device at this point. We use SSH ping telnet from the two virtual machine from the virtual machine while uh, saving the state and then restoring it and you would see later that the connection is preserved. Uh, if you want to test it, the repos, I recommend the git repo on, on the GitHub. Um, also I've talked to, with Peter and probably um, in two weeks, he would create a uh, SVM project and import the GitHub uh, repo in order to, to have an official branch to be able for all of you to test it. Future work, 
uh, as I've tell, uh, tell you earlier, save and restore the virtual block device. Eventually make use of ZFS. Also assess performance, how much time it takes to save a virtual machine, to restore it. And also test with other operating systems after we finish the virtual uh, block device. Also, there are a lot of uh, minor issues to be solved. In, in the path of developing this feature, we concentrate is in concentrating on developing uh, new features, not solving the issues. There are some corner cases left that are documented, of course. Okay, so we basically have a uh, Beehive Save Restore mechanism that is working. Uh, unfortunately, we needed multiple iteration, and at, as Peter warned us, over the save and restore logic. Basically, in the first three months, we throw away a lot of code. We have written code, we have throw away, and so on, until we manage to, uh, to get a design that is very fast and it is extendi extendable for the live migration process. Tedious work on restoring due to a lot of pointers uh, that was cr crashing the, the host, and after crashing the host, we experienced a lot of uh, file system uh, inconsistencies and so on. So when crashing a host, merely we needed to check the beginner file system and so on. Uh, and the last point, a lot of time loss due to the um, virtual machine memory save and restore. Uh, the whole memory management in FIBS is, is quite complex, especially the copy and write stuff. And we couldn't get help even from the community. We had some insight, but uh, we don't, didn't have a person who, know, who knew very well how Beehive is using the VM uh, what you, uh, sorry, the memory management for BSD and how the memory management is working actually. And we have lost here a month or two reading and the code and trying to make a correct implementation. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I also have a video with the demo. So, okay, let's take the questions and then the, the, then the demo. Sorry, you can uh, yes, you can live migrate that. Um, yes, I, I, I've I've meant sorry, I've meant for PCA password and so on. Uh, so you can live migrate, um, you you can live migrate emulated devices, uh, but it's not the scope of the project because uh, the emulated devices doesn't offer you. Uh, good performance, so if you want to use a uh, virtual machine in production, you would use para virtualized drivers or pass-through devices. It's a mistake I, I, I wanted to say about pass-through devices. So you have a, if you have a device that, that is pass-through, even a NIC with multiple virtual functions that is pass-through to a, to a virtual machine, you cannot like migrate that. Okay, and the reason why we didn't test and we probably won't implement the E1000 a migration is that we have to implement a save restore logic, especially for the E1000. It doesn't have a common backend with anything else. So, for example, here in Vertio, we have a common backend, and uh, a lot of work we have done on the Vertio network helped us in saving the Vertio block device. Okay. Sorry for the mistake. Yes, you're right. Okay. Other questions, please. Uh, so, when you take the checkpoint of the memory and write it to BS. Yes. No, f at this point, we, we just, when you say checkpoint, at th that point, you'd save the entire memory disk and state at that point. We just only do this. So like in VMware, we'd right click and save the virtual machine uh, checkpoint. So you can return on, uh, onto there. For live migration, we'll have to do what you are saying. Basically, create a checkpoint, start moving the memory to other host, and then, uh, and then creating basically another checkpoint and start moving and until we have, you have a, a few memory unmodified and then you freeze the, uh, the guest and move the other part. So this was uh, talked truly with Peter 
And it is in plan, but and it, it, it is for, for live migration, not now. But this, this sorry? You have to walk before you <laughs> Yes, of course. And this is why we implemented the cow. So initially, we didn't have any cow. We were saving the, the, the memory, but it wasn't useful for an efficient live migration. OK, thank you. Other questions, please? Yes. So, so actually, actually, from that, we said that we will um, look on the. Oh, okay. So you are talking. Um, you are putting the question that we are taking faults when checkpointing. After checkpoint, you, we shouldn't remove all the copy on write flags. So, you are saying that. During the checkpoint, we will have a lot of falls from the guest. Yes. Okay, this is true. And this probably would impact the performance of a guest who is doing a lot of writes but in memory. But you, you avoid yes, you cannot avoid that. If you want to do live well, migration, you could, you could do it into steps where you, you would actually continue. You, you, there's, there's a flag that will stay in the pages where it touched by, by the guest. So, so you could start. Yes, but how do how do you get how do you get the, the the dirty flags? So how do you get the FreeBSD to to say, uh, to tell you to notify you that that page was modified? Well, that's my point. You you, you don't you don't capture the guest state immediately. You start capturing the memory, and then so once you said to to. I don't get it. So you say that you, to do a copy and write, incremental copy and write, so take the four gigabyte and then the next gigabyte and so on, because at the moment in time, you have a state that you have to save it truly yeah, from the top. OK. Okay, so you are saying to recapture all the pages that have been modified and do your that might be a way of, of limiting the, the impact of, of skipping all those faults. I don't know. So th that dirty bit you are talking about it's for the page written, but I don't think they would be uh concept. This is like no, but that's the pages change, it doesn't make you get these old copies of it. So you, you can you can feel the dirty bits. So uh, you are talking about m uh, managing the dirty bits here and, and mangling with the with the memory management uh, stuff of the VBSD. So that dirty bits are used by the memory management. The FreeBSD itself doesn't manage. Sorry? FreeBSD itself doesn't manage the Yes, it does. EPT. Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually. Yes, actually, uh, the, actually, Peter, uh, actually, Peter added a few bits of code in the memory management of FreeBSD uh, with the EPT flags. So basically, all the level two page tables are, are, are built by the FreeBSD memory, memory management system. Why? Because we want to be able to over provision. So at any point in time, we can create uh, more guests than, um, sorry. You can create guests that have more memory than the, your physical memory, and you are able to swap because you have the memory management there and is doing all the work for you. So right now, the memory management of FreeBSD uh, is um, aware of EPT flags and so. Okay. Uh, so in the early days, uh, this all the EPT page tables were were written by ha by hand, uh, and all the memory was hardwired of the guest, but 
I, I guess three years ago, they changed its implementation. Three years and a half. This was the first part that they did after launching Beehive. And this is why I don't know how to do this and not screwing up something in there. Because we struggle a lot with the copy on write. Again, to, to make it right. Oh, thank you for your input. We'll look on, into this. Other questions, please? Yes? So you have these processes that are running in the virtual machine, and they have descriptors open. And if it's a socket descriptor off somewhere, how do you recreate that socket descriptor? Uh, basically, we save the memory of the virtual machine. OK? So the, it states. We, this is only what we see. So from the host perspective, we only see one process, the Beehive process, which runs the virtual machine. Okay, and it saves its memory. The socket is in that memory. So when we restore the memory, we restore every part of it, including sockets, page tables, and so on. The problem would be uh, with the other end of the socket, because if it takes too much time after restoring it, the connection will be closed, okay? Uh, we haven't studied truly what's happening after a lot, a lot of time after restoring with that socket. But this, that socket should be somehow cleared because the connection, uh, the guest would try to communicate on the socket and it won't manage and that socket should be destroyed automatically. So we don't even involve in there, okay? Changes requests are in flight. Are you draining requests before saving, or you are saving <laughs> requests in progress? Uh, I know about this issue. I don't know Flavius what have done. So uh, actually, Flavius worked on this uh, feature, and I've talked with him about uh, what doing with the requests that are pending. But actually, he freezes the vCPU. Uh, so no, actually, uh, somehow it stops the drivers, but it's, it waits for all the requests to finish in order to have a complete state. But it could be, it could be some chances that we are not, not doing this very well. So it wasn't tested very well. This is why I didn't present the Vertio here, because it's, it, um, Flavius managed to do this a week, a half, or two weeks ago. So <coughs> it's a new future, let's say, for us. And yes, we have that on the, on the to-do list, so to verify. Does a controller receive some kind of event? Okay, now you should synchronize state, or maybe even to send it to guest to make guest free some memory which is not useful to reduce dumping size, or it happens just completely unrelated to virtual machine and processes. So uh, basically, this happens unrelated to the virtual machine. We we do not communicate to the virtual machine. It would be better if you have a daemon, like all the hypervisors have VMware, uh, Hyper-V, and so on, that runs inside the guest, and we could communicate with that daemon and say, OK, right now we, we could start stopping all devices and so on. But we aren't there yet. So we are doing all this work outside of the guest. Basically, uh, this is why we are, we are using the Vertio, because on the Vertio we have a lot of control being para-virtualized. Para uh, we stop the guest, but we let the controller to finish all the requests and then save the state. Okay. So, uh, sorry for you. This is another reason why we use the Vert.io. We have a lot of control on it. On the E1000, for example, um, control of the of the requests, so, so for example, we know when the request has, has completed. And, uh, and also, basically, it's a client-server communication that we implemented, both I.O. In, in the guest and the host, OK? And when freezing the guest, we wait for all the requests to, to uh, sorry, we, we drain all the requests and then save the state. In, in, the, in an emulation part, I don't know if. It's the same. Just Vertio as a ring of the descriptors, uh, you, can, you can wait for. <coughs> yeah, you have a thread that just the drain, the queue. The yes. You can drain that, but also E1000 has a 
are in, and so you can have a thread which, when you, when you stop the gas, you can drain all the, for example, transmission packets that have been. I, I think it's the same, however. <laughs> Your point is clear. Okay. Um, I know we had some issues, but. Okay. For sure, for sure it's all, I mean, being an universal device is more complicated, right? Uh, no. Uh, no. And no, okay, and performance issues. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, please. Yep. So, in the state on this thing, you have all the configuration parameters for how the hive is started. Yes. So, like this maintains, like is it copying the actual uh, invocation flags of, of the beehive binary, or is it just internal state? Or it's internal state. Uh, Actually, so when you are sending, when you are sending uh, the parameters on the that command line, basically some internal structures are populated with the uh, memory amount, with the number of VCPUs, and so on. But we cannot reproduce all the flags from inside Beehive. Okay, and for now we are basically running the guest with the. Uh, we are using that. Um, Beehive load command with the same parameters. Okay, so this would be in charge of uh, some external script of saving and restoring. Okay, we aren't doing, we aren't saving on disk any, any of this. We can do this, but this, again, this would be in charge of an uh, external script, not our work from inside of, of Beehive. Right, and can you restore on a different machine? Um, if you can restore on a different machine, I guess they tried. The yes, they tried, but uh, they didn't try on different. So they were two identical yeah, hardware yeah, machines. Hardware, but hardware, uh, it well, should so uh, it should work because the, we are saving. You're, you're copying the DMCA state, right? Sorry. You're, you're copying the DMCA. No, we are t taking from the VMCS only the the fields that we are interesting. So at first. Yes. Yeah, yep. Uh, that that won't work. Yes. No, that won't work because that depends on the CPU. Yep. So you have you have to save all the all the fields individually and represent it, represent them whatever way you want. So Let me look on the code. Be I guess the, the new version of the code is doing this because we had trouble with, with saving the, the page. And uh, I don't, f I guess that that code is old, uh, on a slide, because we had trouble in, uh, in loading the VMCS on the same machine of the same CPU because it had uh, host registers that were too old from the state when we saved the virtual machine. So basically, we are taking from the VMCS only the only the guest registers. Let me look on the on the code later, and I will tell you. So theoretically, it should work. If not, we have to fix this. Other questions? Okay, uh, it's a video. I don't think. Hmm. Uh, it's not. Impossible. Yes, I know, but it's not. Wait, <laughs> okay. Right now we are loading up a uh, guest and running it. It's a virtual machine called this VM. Okay. Okay, right now we are getting the virtual machine IP address. And go to another tab and SSH into that virtual machine. So at this point we have to console the console of the virtual machine and the SSH session. Uh, 
there it it uh, it said some commands. So it it writes something on the console. That that is all. Okay. Root at Puge is the host. At this point, we will suspend the virtual machine. As you can see, the virtual machine disappeared, okay? So it was the console. When we hit suspend, the virtual machine died. And also, we saved all its state on the disk. At this point, we load again the virtual machine, or an empty virtual machine. And when hitting behind run, we have a flag minus R to tell what checkpoint to use when running the guest. And you see there, some command not found because it tried to execute. And also, the SSH session is still up. OK? So you have the SSH session working. And another test with another checkpoint. So uh, basically, it runs a while loop, which uh, displays the date every 2.0.2 uh, 0, 0, 0 .2 seconds. You can see here we suspend again and create another checkpoint. So this is another checkpoint of the virtual machine. You can see there the virtual machine died, and you can see the SSH session that. It doesn't show anymore. And now we restore the virtual machine. At this point, the SSH session is still working and displaying the while loop. So basically, we restore the virtual machine from the state it was. OK, this was the demo. Again, you have the Git repo. Uh, it was rebased with the, with the master, I guess, one week ago. So we are. Um, we in line with the new notification of FreeBSD, and we can test this future. And you could see that all the parameters were in there. Basically, we have to know the parameters. We have to create a wrapper on top of this saving in another file on disk these parameters of which you have run behind. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much for your attention and for your questions. It was. Okay, if you have any questions, you have my email, all my students' email, and you can send us a ping if you have any problems in testing it, and we'll help you bring it up. Thank you. Thank you.